Small businesses are getting slammed by the pandemic. So what do you do if you're a small business owner with a lot of debt? Ted Michaelis is here to discuss it starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Statistics Canada says that there were 58,000 fewer active businesses in Canada in September 2020 compared to September 2019. The Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses says that around a quarter of a million businesses could be at risk of shutting down, and that's almost one in five out of every small businesses. Why? Well, because business is hard. Ted Michaelis is here to discuss that, discuss this. Do those stats surprise you? No, it makes sense. I mean, there's so many people now that over the last 20 years, the whole gig economy is built on people being in business for themselves. Uh, The large companies employ people on contracts, as subcontractors, as uh, independent service providers. So none of those people really have jobs per se. They are a business. And that's a key point because when we mention people who own their own business, you think of somebody who's got a shop and there's 12 people working there. Yeah, you're thinking of Joe the plumber who's got a fleet of trucks and a bunch Absolutely. of guys. But it's not. It's not. It's somebody who might be a... Jane the data analyst. Yeah. That's, she's, she had a contract for $40,000 a year to work from home and no, there's no work. Yeah. And, you know, you might be a, a courier driver. There's all sorts of different things where you are, are self-employed. And I think- How about Uber driver? No, <laughs> well, there you go. Well, yeah. <laughs> Uber and, and Lyft. Exactly. Those are, are you are a self-employed person, although right. we, can, we can argue, argue about, that about that. And what makes business so hard, I think, to be, what, why it's so hard to be self-employed is you have to do everything. Right. So when you work for a big, huge company, if the computer doesn't work, you call IT, they come and fix it. Yep. But when you are on your own, you're responsible for making the product or the service, which probably is what you're good at. That's why you went into it in, in the first yep. place. But you're also now in charge of selling it, which is a totally different ballgame. Yep. you got to keep all the records, the accounting, all that kind of stuff. Um, staff, that's all your huh. department too. And there's all kinds of government regulations you've never had to deal with that now you have to. Yeah, you've got to make sure you're filling out your EHT form and your HST and your right. WSIB. PD7A on the 15th of That's every right, month, exactly all this right. stuff. All these, all these initials. And so we get people coming in to see us all the time and they say, yeah, the government's after me because I didn't get my, you know, whatchamacallit filed on time. Right. And I didn't even know I was supposed to file that. I'm, I'm a roofer. I do a really great job at that. And now I'm, have, I'm, they're assessing me interest and penalties and some kind of fine and all sorts of crap. Yeah. So being in business is not easy. Right. It's, it's very difficult. And because you're, you're it. You're the, you're the last line of defense. Now, since the pandemic started, and we are recording this the final Monday in January. I don't know what the date is. January well, first anniversary of the first case in Canada. There you go. So there that's, go. that's, that's something. January 2021. As of now, the federal government has provided more than $100 billion in support to businesses. So I'm not talking about CERB. I'm talking about the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, Canada Emergency Business Account, rent subsidies, and so on. And yet, here we are. There are a lot of businesses that are still teetering or have closed. Why is that? Why was that not enough? Why has that not been enough so far? Well, the problem with any kind of government support is that First, how do you qualify for it? So what do you set the parameters? And they anticipated a short lockdown that just keeps getting extended and extended and extended. And so if I'm a small business, I've got no real cash reserves because I run a pretty tight ship. I've got to make payroll next week, which may just be paying myself. And suddenly there's no cash flow. Well, so I've got nothing to rely on. I've got to go to this government support. Um, Some of it was complicated to apply for. Well, you all saw the stuff in the media for the people that were just on the CERB, which was the unemployment replacement. Well, the business stuff is even more complicated. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that. And and you and I have both helped a number of, you know, people we know apply for, for these types of programs. For right. the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, you've got to calculate what your revenue is for different periods to make sure that there is a, a suitable decline. You've got to add up all your payroll, people who are employed, not employed, whatever, and crunch all the numbers. And for a lot of small businesses, if I've only got one employee, and I know one guy told me that. He said, you know what? It's not even worth it. I, it's right. going to cost more to have my accountant crunch all those numbers than to, to do it myself. You also made a really key point about cash reserves. Right. So I think we have probably weathered this pandemic as well as any business has, even though right. our volume is down somewhere between 30 and 50 percent since it started because fewer people need to go bankrupt if they're not working. So our work has really dropped. But 
We've been in business for 22 years. Right. So we've had time to build up, you know, cash reserves, technology. Well, and as anyone would expect, we don't carry a lot of debt. <laughs> That's right. We're somewhat debt averse. <laughs> we're so funny we're, that way. We're, there's, there's nothing owing on our, our bank operating line. So when the pandemic started, we were able to say, okay, we can actually deploy our employees right. to home. We were able to spend the money on more computers, webcams, microphones, headsets, all that kind of stuff. Nobody would call us a small business anymore either, though. That's probably true. So that's an interesting question as to what the definition of that is. But right. yes, you're right. So you get to a certain size and hopefully you've got a, a bit of the wherewithal to do that. That was not the case for a lot of people, certainly if you were in the early stages of your business. So what has happened with business bankruptcies since the pandemic started? Well, just like personal bankruptcies, when the pandemic started, all insolvency activity basically came to a stop because the courts weren't enforcing any kind of orders. The government wasn't trying to collect. Businesses were just like people. So if nobody's pressuring you to deal with your debts, you don't have to deal with your debts. Now, that's all been trending upward because the world is learning how to deal with this pandemic. Courts are operating virtually. The government is now calling people saying, hey, where's our HST return? Where's the, the income tax from last year? So things are starting to trend up, and that's going to accelerate. Now, one, as we get better at dealing with operating in the pandemic, but two, at some point, they've got to start collecting revenue again to pay back that $100 billion they've kicked out to the world. Yeah, and what we're seeing with Canada Revenue Agency is that they are making phone calls, but they're not right. really going hardcore collection. So what they're doing right now is they're making a connection. They're making sure that you know that they're out there, that reminding you you've got these obligations, but they're not saying, we're going to put a gun to your head. Yeah. That's coming. That's coming. <laughs> so it's, yeah, there's going to be a, a, a long, slow ramp up probably. So what are you seeing out there? You and I spend all day on the phone or on video conference calls with people. What are you seeing out there? What's happening on the ground? Well, so here's the issue with most of what we're going to call small businesses. Uh, they have to deal with the public. Almost all of them are some kind of face-to-face -face business. And if the public's not allowed to get out, suddenly their revenue is dried up. There's no stream. There are some winners out there. There are some little businesses that, wow, this is the opportunity of a lifetime and they're taking advantage of it. But by and large, people are suffering because they have to deal with the public and they're not allowed to. Right. And the winners, well, the losers are pretty obvious. Uh, if you run a hair salon, a restaurant, a gym, anything that is completely public facing, the, the winners have been, you know, delivery companies. If you've got the contract yep. to deliver for Amazon, then you're, you're literally busy seven days a week. Um, you know, big box stores have probably benefited while well, the little guys have been closed. Right. Um, even something like a flower shop. Uh, there are a lot of flower shops that are actually doing better now because, well, I can't go visit grandma, couldn't go to see her at Christmas, can't see her for her birthday. Why don't I send her some flowers? Um, they're not doing much oh. in the way of weddings, but I guess there's some funeral activity. So they, they've actually won. There are all kinds of people sending flowers just to cheer themselves up. Yeah. And so, you know, winners and losers obviously has, right. has happened. So, okay. Today we want to talk about small business and debt. And so you made the comment that we're not really a small business anymore because we've got, you know, hundreds no, of We still think we are. Yeah, we think we are because, well, it's two guys who run it. Right. I mean, how much smaller can you get than that? One guy. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. I guess that, that's mathematically exactly correct. So let's start with the basics. What – there are two, I guess, three forms of corporate organization. You could be a corporation, a sole proprietorship, or a partnership. Let's ignore partnership because that's basically just a sole proprietorship. What's yep. the difference between the two? What do you typically see with a small business? All right. Well, so the best way that people get their head around the whole idea of a corporation is think that legally you're creating this separate entity that is your business. So if you don't have a corporation, you are your business. So even if you, you know, I've got Ted's lawn keeping service, um, I'm, I'm Ted. So I'm the business. I'm the one who's responsible for all the obligations, all the debts, all the government filings. If I'm a corporation, I've created this separate legal thing that is now legally responsible. Now, the ridiculous part of that is, of course, there's always a person responsible for the corporation. So it's a... It's, On that, it, that's that's a really the next that. question then. Right. So I, I totally get what you're saying. A corporation is a separate legal entity. It's like I've had a child. It's separate, separate from me. Right. And so that corporation, um, if it owes money, well, I'm not responsible for it because it's a separate legal entity. Except. But <laughs> right. in a lot of cases, you are responsible for it. So when do business debts become personal debts? Well, so the, the most obvious case is anytime you sign for them. 
So if you've guaranteed a debt for your corporation, then you've probably said, if my corporation can't pay, I'll do it. There's also various crown debts that you're automatically responsible for. So as an officer or director, you're responsible for the company's HST collected and not paid for their corporate taxes, um, to some extent payroll. I mean, there's all sorts of legal obligations for directors of corporations. But the ones we're focusing on right now are if you sign for something, then you're probably responsible for it. Yeah, and that's, I think, the key. So yep. if you're not sure if you're responsible personally or not, well, talk to your accountant, talk to your lawyer. The fancy word for it is deem trust. Any money that you collect on behalf of the government that you're then going to give them, you're personally responsible for that. So HST or GST would be the obvious example. Employee source deductions would that's be the one. obvious example. Yep. Um Corporate taxes are not a personal obligation because you didn't hold the money um, and then give it to them. It was it was tax on what you earned. Obviously, the business is responsible for it. And and then the obvious one, as you said, anything you signed for. Right. Small business loans, company credit cards, all that sort of stuff. The lease on your company premises. Yep. It's yep. very common for the landlord to say, okay, I know you've got this company, 1234 Canada Inc., but Sign I'm again. making you sign personally as well. Right. So. Okay, what happens then if I'm operating a business and it was doing okay before COVID? And, you know, maybe it wasn't making billions of dollars, but I was I was getting by. And then COVID hits and now I'm struggling. What should I do? What's the thought process you would go through on that? So the most important question always, regardless of COVID, is, is my business viable? Can I actually make a living at this business? So what COVID has done is added an extra element to that question. Can I survive long enough while I'm shut down that I can be viable again? Or am I actually viable during the pandemic? You got to know if it's worth staying in business. And that's a hard question. It's a very hard question. We've been asking that question of all of our clients who operate a business for, you know, 20 some years. And it's hard because you you are the business. Right. And it's hard to separate yourself from it. So, for example, someone comes in to see me and I say, so do you think your business is viable? Oh, yeah. You know, look at look at all the sales I'm making. Right. Yeah, but look at all the expenses you're incurring to make those sales. And if the flip side of that is, how much could you be earning if you were just working for somebody else that was doing those sales? Right. And there have been many times where I've said to someone, you know what, if you got a job at Walmart as a greeter making $14 an hour, you would actually be making more money. Yeah. It's not how much money comes in, it's how much money is left over. And small business owners hate that question because one of the reasons you're in business for yourself is because you're in business for yourself. Yeah. And so there's an element of, I want to do this, I can do this. Yeah, and I don't want to work for someone else, which is kind of why we started Hoy's Michaelis. We, <laughs> we were not good employees. We have big egos and like to do it our own way. Right. And this whole question about business viability. So, okay, when the pandemic is over, when I'm able to get back to normal operations, Will my business be viable? Whether it was viable before or not is one issue. If it wasn't viable before, it's probably not going to be viable now. But right. will it be viable again? So, for example, will customers return? Right. So you operate, um, you know, Ted's landscaping business, I think you said. Sure, that's called. what I'm talking about. Yep. You, you cut people's lawns. Well, last summer, they were all stuck at home, so they all just cut their own lawn. Right. Because I got time, and you know what? It got me some exercise. I got to get out. And some of those people now are going to keep doing it because they realize they like doing it. Exactly right. So will those customers come back? A restaurant. Well, you know, we all like going to a restaurant with our friends and everything. But for the last, you know, year, that's been virtually impossible other than takeout. So a lot of people have learned to cook. Yeah. What's that old saying? How many weeks do you have to do something before a habit becomes a... Yeah, it, it, be, it becomes new, the new it. thing. And right. it's, it's something like, I don't know, 10 times, 15 times, three yeah. weeks, whatever. It's certainly we're less 52 than a weeks year. Now, right? yeah, yeah. We're, we're <laughs> pretty much at a year. Yep. And so, you know what? Okay, I have to go to the grocery store, you know, once a week, whatever. But now that I've bought the fancy pan and the other thing and the thing and the thing and the thing, right? Uh, you know what? It's actually not hugely more inconvenient to be cooking at home than to get in my car, drive to the restaurant, wait for half an hour, whatever. Um, haircuts. Oh, yeah. I mean, people watching on video will see that I have not had a haircut for a while or other or things. Perhaps shaved. Or shaved, perhaps. <laughs> and you know what? A lot of people have you know, bought the clippers and it's like, well, you know what? I can sort of hack away at it myself. Everyone else is wearing long hair anyways, so nobody's right. really offended by it. Will we all go back to the same schedule at the hair place or not? I don't know. So you really got to ask yourself, how will things be different? Another big example is people are working from home. Right. 
So if you operate the little uh, coffee stand under the big office tower, how long is it going to be before people come back? You know, it's, it's not going to be quick. So, okay, let's assume you've gone through the thought process and, you know, whether the business is, well, let's say the business isn't viable. Right. I've decided that, you know what, I'm too far in the hole. And even when things get back to normal, they won't be back to normal. Mm -hmm. What then are my options? What's the thought process okay. I should be going through? So if the business isn't viable, what am I going to do with it? So the short answer is, I guess you should be closing. Well, do you just lock the doors and be done with it? Or do you try to sell it to somebody? Do you have to try to uh, restructure and deal with what's there? So there's, you have to look at, what am I going to do with this thing that isn't worth keeping? So let's just, yeah, if it's not viable, then you can no longer be there. There's right. no point. Well, it's, if it's not viable, then there's no argument to keep it open. Right. No, it's just a so strategy just, of how, how do, I, do close I close it. it? Right. So, okay, the first thing would be, is there somebody else who might buy it from me or take it over from me for right. a dollar? Is there something in this business that has value? A list of customers? Do I have a bunch of old inventory that somebody else can do something with? Uh, do I have a skill set that somebody else will employ? I just, I just don't, I can't do the rest of the business aspects of it. Yeah, maybe I've got a good lease that uh, my competitor would like to take over. Maybe location, there's some location, reason location, to look exactly. Right, yeah. So, so yeah, okay. Start by talking to potential, you know, acquirers, competitors, and maybe it's like I'll give you the business for free if you just, you just take it over. Yep. Um, what will or if you've got inventory, you can sell. For example, maybe Something. I can, I can, I can liquidate. And COVID's stuff. complicating all of this, right? Yeah, because kinda. nobody's going to come look at your business. It's and and if you if things are off because of COVID, your business will be undervalued anyway. Right, which is why it may be. Well, I'm locking the doors. I'm handing the key to the landlord, and I'm saying goodbye. Ya. Yep. So let's assume that my business is a corporation. Okay. Let's take the complicated version first. So. You already explained it. A corporation is a separate legal entity. Right. So if I'm closing my business, does my corporation have to therefore go bankrupt? No, they're not the same thing. Closing the business is like, um, well, so you literally, let's use a physical example. You close the doors tonight and you turn the lock and you put a sign up saying out of business. And now it's, what are you going to do? You're not going to generate any new revenues. You're presumably not generating any new expenses, although that's not necessarily true. And you only become bankrupt if you voluntarily say, well, I need relief from my debt. So the business is going to declare bankruptcy, which is a legal situation. Or if somebody comes along and tries to petition you into bankruptcy. So bankruptcy only makes sense for a business if there's something in the business that people are going to fight over. So for example, let's say... Um, What's well, a good example? I have a small car dealership and I didn't have an operating line of credit. I just had 20 cars in inventory. That's not really a small business, but it fits our example here. Um, I close the business tomorrow. What am I going to do with those 20 cars? Or the widgets, my machines that I used to make, or all my lawn care equipment. What's going to happen to those things? Well, I can sell them off myself, liquidate, turn them into cash, and try to deal with the company's obligations or debts. Or I can say, well, this stuff is worth 10000 bucks, and my business owes 200000 so I'm going to put it into bankruptcy so that there's an organized way to deal with it. Or the, a bank or somebody else could come along and say, no, no, we're going to sue you and put you into bankruptcy so we can get our fair share of that money. Not much of that happens anymore. No, it's, it's actually very rare. And again, the key point is a bankruptcy. Whether you're a person or a corporation, yep. it's to bring about the orderly distribution of whatever assets you've got and protect you from people doing stuff to you. So in most cases, okay, I, I'm operating a, a restaurant. There is no assets or anything that anyone's right. going to buy from me. No customer list, nothing. You know, maybe they're all leaseholds owned by the, the yep. landlord. There's no customers. So I just say to the landlord, here you go. Here's the keys. I'm not going through a bankruptcy right? because a corporate bankruptcy costs money. It does. And at the end of the day, it doesn't protect the owner from any of the risks that the owner already has. And that's the part that lots of people don't understand. They figure if we bankrupt my corporation, I'm safe. Well, you're not. Because remember what we said, you're responsible for anything that you signed. So you probably guaranteed that lease. The company leased the restaurant's location, but you guaranteed the company would pay it. So now the landlord can come after you personally. There's all those government obligations we talked about. So bankrupting the corporation almost never 
protects the owner in any kind of way whatsoever. So it's, it's almost always a waste of money. Yeah, and we could get into a more complicated discussion about a proposal for a corporation, which could include a term that says, hey, the, the owner gets personally uh, protected. Talk about receiverships and all sorts of other stuff, but what's the point? That's, that's very complicated. The, yeah. the key point is that, yeah, in most cases, a business closes their doors and that's it, and that's right. why they don't go bankrupt. And I mean, the media is constantly asking me this question. You get asked all the time, well, why are business bankruptcies so low? Shouldn't they be skyrocketing? Well, no, you don't understand. Business is closed. They shut their doors. Right. That's it. There is no no. The only money. bankrupt a company if there's something to fight over. And usually if a business is closed, it's because there's nothing left right. in the business. It's already been liquidated. Right. Now, what are the implications of secured creditors? So if my, in your, your example, the car dealership Carter, yeah. didn't have a, an operating line. Well, what if they did? What if the, the, all the cars in inventory yeah. were secured by the bank? So almost all little car dealerships have what they call a, uh, an operating line on their inventory. And so it's either Scotia or TD that's doing it. They basically say, whatever you got in inventory, I, as the bank, have a right to take that inventory first to pay off your debt. That's why I'm giving you this money so you can have inventory so you can sell the cars. So secured debts are outside of bankruptcy law anyway. They basically, you've gone ahead beforehand and said, if I can't pay, you can have this thing. Mortgages are secured debts, uh, car loans, car leases, all sorts of stuff falls into this category. Yeah, and in that case, if the bank has a floor plan, I think is what they call it, yep. for the, the cars in my car dealership, well, the bank's going to say, okay, well, we're taking the cars and we're going to sell them. Right. We don't care if the business goes bankrupt or not. We are realizing on our security. Yeah, I mean, the most common form of security for banks is something called a GSA, General Security Agreement. And as soon as you close the business, they then have a right to receivables, cash, inventory, all sorts of stuff. And that's another reason why bankruptcies just aren't that common for businesses, because the bank's already got the right to everything of value. Yep. Here you go, bank. You you yep. worry about it. So that's the case of a corporation. What if my business is not a corporation? It's a sole yeah. proprietorship. So think back to earlier in the in the show when we were saying if you're a sole proprietorship, so I own Ted's landscaping business. It's not a company, a corporation. It's a company. I own this business. Well, there's no difference between the business and me. So if the business has a debt, I have the debt. So I can't close me. I can look at solutions for me, which might be a personal bankruptcy or a personal proposal. Um, and those are worth talking about, actually, because unlike the corporation, people will come after individuals. And the only way to protect yourself from legal action is to get some sort of legal defense. A proposal or a bankruptcy is an excellent legal defense when somebody's coming after you for debt. So, e so I operated a business. As a sole proprietorship, it was not a corporation. I had to close down. Now I've got people coming after me. And they're coming after you personally. Personally. Could yep. be the government, the landlord, suppliers, whatever. That may then be necessary for me to personally yep. do a personal bankruptcy or a consumer proposal to protect myself personally, even though it was business debt. That's right. And in fact, let's go back five minutes. A corporation, we said, is just going to close. But the the directors and owners are still liable for all sorts of debts. It may be necessary for them to do a personal bankruptcy or a proposal. Don't do it in the company. Do it personally because you got to protect yourself. Right, which is why, the, the I mean, we don't do corporate insolvencies, but we do a lot of insolvencies for people who operated corporations or operated businesses and now need that personal protection. That's right. And so if you're in that situation, while you give us a call, we walk you through it. My first question is going to be, okay, so are you working again? Are you doing something? Like what, right. what's- How are you just supporting yourself? Right. So that becomes a, a pretty key consideration. So we talked about the worst case scenario, which is I'm shutting my business down. I, I, I can't right. go on. What if my business probably will be viable once the lockdown ends- what then are my options going forward? All right. So you've decided that the business is viable once the world opens up again. Now the question is, how do you get from here to there? So if the business is going to remain closed for the next couple of months because of lockdown, have you got access to credit? Have you got resources? Um, have you got the ability that to just suspend operations and open up, open up again? Well, let's talk about access to credit because that's, right. a, that's a pretty big one. So I had my business and perhaps I got um, – I had an operating line, like you said, a GSA or a, right. a line of credit Runner. with the bank. Um, and maybe I've had to draw on that line of credit during the lockdown because I've had to pay my landlord and keep the lights on even though my employees are laid off or whatever. Maybe I'm getting maxed out. Mm -hmm. Is the bank going to continue – to advance me credit? Or is the bank going to say, ooh, times are tough. We're clawing back on that. Right. So even though the customers might return, if you don't have access to credit, what about your suppliers? Right. Are they going to work with you? Because if you got no cash coming in, we assume that you're not paying them. 
Well, if you're not paying them, are they going to still be your suppliers in the future? Are they going to give you the opportunity to bridge that gap between what do I got to do now so that I can be viable after the pandemic? Because your suppliers have the same problem you do. Right. They've been closed down. They've been cash flow constrained. So can you go to your suppliers and say, look, I know I owe you a bunch of money from before. I want to buy new product, but it's going to be three months before I can pay you. Yep. Mm, might be a difficult conversation. Maybe you have to go to different suppliers. And when you go to different suppliers, are they going to give you credit right off the bat? Yeah, probably they want COD. Yeah, COD, because you're, yep. a, you're a brand new customer. What about customers? Are they going to come back? We already right. talked about that. Mm, if they found other places, they're all buying their stuff online right now. Right. They change their spending patterns. They change what they do. So how do you get them back? How do you get them back? So there's some practical things to make sure that, yes, in fact, your business is not only viable, can can actually operate. What about the debt then that I have that's associated with my business? Right. Well, and so now it's you've got to carry it during the pandemic, but now the new viable business in the future has got to be able to carry and deal with whatever you had to take on to get you there. And so, well, okay, we're still talking about sole proprietorships or businesses that aren't corporations, although we can expand to that if you want. Maybe you need to do some kind of proposal or a, a bankruptcy just to get yourself a clean start so that your business will be viable in the future. It's a lot easier to make a, a small business successful if it's not carrying a whole bunch of old debt for, for mistakes you made in the past. And in a lot of cases, the owner has financed the business with their own credit cards, yep. their own line of credit. So they actually have a lot of personal debt that isn't in the name of the business. So yeah, in a lot of cases, it's like, well, I guess I'm going to personally do a consumer proposal to get rid of my debt. That's right. And then, like you say, I now don't have to take as much out of the business to, to finance right. my own debt. Um, it's also not uncommon for the old corporation to just be shut down mm -hmm. and, okay, I'm going to start a brand new corporation so that I can get a new lease so that I can, you know. Yeah, that used to be a trick in the restaurant industry that actually it's applicable to more people. You'd open a restaurant, you'd spend a fortune on leaseholds. It would look great, but you couldn't pay for it. So it would go broke, but somebody else would reopen the restaurant. They're now carrying less debt than you were. They probably go broke, too. I think it was the third or fourth time that they yep. actually made a go of it. Yeah, if you're the fifth person to occupy that premises, <laughs> all the kitchen equipment is pretty free. much paid for and, and so on. So there is certainly restructuring that has to happen both on the personal and the corporate side. Again, kind of beyond the scope of this show. Right. There is one government support program we haven't talked about that I want to address, yeah. and that is the Canada Emergency Business Account, the CEBA. Mm -hmm. It's from... Export Development Corporation, but it's administered through CRA and through your bank. Right. It was a $40,000 loan, which in December was increased to $60,000. If you pay it off in full by December 31st, 2022, so you got two years, then you get 25% forgiveness on the $40,000 loan, or if it was a $60,000 loan, 25% on the first 40 k and 50% on the rest. So if you got a $60,000 loan, pay it off in full, you only have to pay $40,000 back. You get to keep, you, you get a grant in effect of $20,000. Right. 800,000 businesses have been approved for this, $40 billion in funding that is, is coming from the government. This is for businesses, so it can be a corporation or a sole proprietorship. Correct. It ha you have to be intending to continue operations. So if you're closing down, then that's not what it's for. Yep. You have to have a CRA business number prior to March 1st, 2020, meaning you were already an operating business. You couldn't set up a new business and get the yeah. loan. And you yep. can't set up 10 new businesses to get 10 new loans. And there were two ways to do it, either through the payroll stream, which in order to qualify last year, you had to have payroll between 20000 and a million and a half, or the non-deferrable expense stream. This would be for businesses that don't have payroll or had less less than 20 grand in payroll. I won't go through the complicated how it all works. Right. So, I got this SIBA loan. I intended to continue and now I don't think I can pay it back. Right. When you took the loan out, everybody thought thought the lockdown would be 3 months and now we're a year into this thing. Right. So, what are my options if I can't pay back my SIBA loan? Well, let's start if you're a corporation. One of the interesting things we discovered was that there are no personal guarantees on these corporate SIBA loans. So if the business closes and goes bust, yeah, that's it. And so these are administered through your bank, but the government is guaranteeing it. So the bank is happy to lend the money because even if you don't pay, the, the government, government backstops it. So this is going to be fantastically profitable for the banks right? Well, because they have zero risk. Um, and the government is obviously paying the interest during the interest-free period and, and backstopping them for any loans. So, But yes, based on, and again, 
check your own legal agreement on this. Don't right. be taking our See advice See how many times it. you sign the contract. Right. But the documents we have seen, and we you know put some of them up on the screen, there is no personal guarantee. Correct. So if you got the loan through a corporation and the corporation can't pay and the corporation goes out of business, well, you're not personally on the hook for it because you didn't sign as a person. If you signed it personally, though... Right. Then this is it's as if you got a loan or a line of credit yourself because you did. And so that means by the end of 2022, you've got to either pay it back or negotiate terms to start paying it back. Yeah. And they do have terms that if you don't pay it back by the end of 2022, OK, interest starts accumulating. But that means you're now paying back the full 40 or the full 60. Well, and so what's going to happen is in December of next year, anybody that will qualify for a regular regular loan will apply for it so that they can pay off and get to take advantage of the 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 forgiveness portion. But a lot of people aren't going to be able to qualify for that loan. I mean, they got this loan because the government guaranteed it. They couldn't get it themselves. That's when it's really going to be a problem for yeah, people. Yeah, so our, our phones will be ringing in the future, even if they're not ringing now. And just to be very clear here, government debts are dischargeable in a bankruptcy sure. or a consumer proposal. Income taxes are, source deductions, HST, all of those things are deductible. Um, dischargeable. Dischargeable, sorry. They, yeah. And so if you got the SIBA loan and end up going bankrupt, well, then, yes, it will be wiped out. If you personally got CERB or got, you know, owe taxes on the CERB you received and can't pay it, then, yes, that will also be uh, dischargeable in a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy. Yeah. One word of caution is that if you somehow obtained any of these benefits through misrepresentation, the, the bankruptcy rules won't apply. But yeah. I mean, so our example where you started 10 different businesses to get right. 10 different SIBA loans, yeah, you're probably going to get caught on that. So. Okay, that is a huge amount of information, and I'm sure people listening are, you know, their heads are spinning. So <laughs> let's finish with practical advice, advice people can actually use. If you operate a small or medium-sized business and you're struggling with debt, what's your advice? Okay, first off, you have to recognize the warning signs, which means you've got to stay on top of this. You've got to realize that cash is tight. I'm having difficulty dealing with all of my ongoing obligations. Um, the most common thing people do when money gets tight is they stop paying their government stuff because they're not calling you and reminding you every month to pay it. Um, yeah, and they can't you know, stop the supply like your supplier can. But we right. already talked about the fact that HST, source deductions, these are personal obligations of yours, even if you are operating through a corporation. That's right. So they've got to be paid. So if money is getting tight, you need to talk to the first stage, at least your accountant or somebody to, to realize Am I going to get a point where I can't meet any of these obligations and then what am I going to do about it? Um, the best way to do that is just to, to create well, financial statements. Look, take, put together a balance sheet. This is where I'm at today. I'm going to project this is where I'm going to be. Again, can I get from here to there and yeah. survive? If I'm going to be locked down for three more months and I've got three more months worth of rent payments to make, can I actually do it? So obviously a cash flow is important. The balance yeah. sheet is the starting point. What have I got? What do I owe? What do I own? How can I actually pay for it going forward? Which brings us to the point we already hammered away at and we'll hammer away at again. Is your business viable? And is it viable today? Is it viable six months from now when the pandemic's over? And how do you get from here to there? And I totally agree because I'm biased that you should be getting professional advice. Yeah. I and think talking to an accountant is a good idea. They understand your business. They can help you with cash flows, that sort of thing. Talking to a lawyer Probably not a bad idea, depending on what you're planning to do. As long as you wash afterwards. Hey, there you go. So, sorry, lawyers. Um, well, things like preferential payments, for example. And we're not right. going to get into what that is, but you want to understand if I'm paying this guy and not paying that guy, what are the impl um, what are the implications of that? Right. Um, and then obviously understanding what you're personally liable for. I think we, we talked about that. What about liquidating assets? So let's say I've got an RSP. Well, I could cash that in and fund my business. Is that a good idea or not? Yeah, that's a really tough decision because RSPs are protected under the law. And what you're doing is you're setting aside something for the future. And so if you start cashing out your future to pay for today, okay, well, what are you going to do in the future? So it's risky. You really want to get some good advice. Um, I'm not sure getting advice from your investment counselor is the kind of advice we're talking about here because they're going to say, don't touch it. That doesn't make any sense. Accountant, lawyer, somebody like you or myself. We'll give you an honest appraisal of, does it make sense to be sending more money after 
what you already spent. Yeah, if I know that two months from now, my business is going to come back gangbusters and we're going to be wickedly busy, then okay, maybe mortgaging my future by taking money out of my RSP is a good idea. And remember, yeah. you're getting hit with the taxes on that when you take it out. So. Correct. You take out a dollar, you don't get to you don't get to keep a dollar. So in that case, okay, maybe it's worth it. But if your business is teetering and depleting your retirement savings so that you can close your business four months from now instead of today, probably doesn't make sense. And, right. and you're right. If you file a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal, under most circumstances, your RSP is protected. You're not going to lose it. And again, that's why you get professional advice so we can actually explain how that all works. Right. So if you really think you're in trouble talk to somebody. Actually, you know what? If you suspect you're in trouble, talk to somebody. Because if you suspect you are, my guess is you are. So, Yep. And I think that's a great way to end it. We are here. Um, our staff aren't, but uh, <laughs> we are available. Our whole team is available by phone, by video. And it doesn't cost anything to bounce an idea off us to ask some, uh, some questions. Right. And in a lot of cases, we'll say, yeah, you're good. You, you know, you don't have to worry about it. Do these two or three things, but better to get the advice up front so you know what's going on. That's right. Excellent. Ted, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for being here. As I said at the start, running a business or being self-employed is difficult even during good times. And it's certainly wickedly overwhelming now for a lot of people. Some businesses are going to survive. Some will actually thrive. Right. But of course, some are going to ultimately fail. Now more than ever, you need to understand your options, make a plan. So if you're suffering with overwhelming debt, as Ted just said, reach out to a licensed insolvency trustee or other professional who can understand all of your debt management options. We've had a lot of contact from people over the last year who hear the podcast and fire us emails, put comments on YouTube, whatever. And obviously you can track us down at hoys.com, H-O-Y-E-S.com. And I would also like it if you would help me, uh, you know, beat the YouTube algorithm by liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment, and by subscribing on your favorite podcast app if you are listening and not watching this. That is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. <laughs> <laughs>